Aloha, everyone. Welcome to Hawaii Together on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Kili'i Akina, your host and also president of the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii. If you know anything about Hawaii's healthcare industry, you realize that it's almost on life support. We have a shortage of doctors and other personnel. If you live on the neighbor islands, you could wait up to a year to get an appointment with a specialist, or you may not be able to do that at all on the island, and you'll have to go to Oahu or to the mainland. We've heard some very sad stories of people dying without the appropriate medical attention simply because they couldn't get it. Now, there are many things we can do about Hawaii's healthcare situation. And at the Grassroot Institute, we have made several proposals. There's one thing in particular, and that's what I'd like to talk a bit about today. That's taking a careful review, making a careful review of the approval process for new hospitals or clinics or medical facilities. Right now, to, to build a new medical facility, even a kidney dialysis unit, or add new beds to an existing hospital, healthcare businesses have to go through a whole bunch of hoops, a very arduous state approval process in order to obtain what is called a certificate of need, that's C-O-N, certificate of need. So why do these rules exist? Are they here to help people have access to medical care or do they hinder? And can we change these rules so that we can have for our people the kind of access to health care that they deserve? Those are some of the questions that we're going to ask today as we talk with my guests. Joining me is Matthew Mitchell, PhD. He's an economist. And um, Dr. Mitchell is a senior research fellow at the Knee Center for the Study of Occupational Regulation at West Virginia University. Dr. Knee or Matt, aloha. Welcome to the program. Aloha. Thank you so much for having me. Well, Matt, uh, I, I'm delighted that you and I are able to see each other from time to time at national conferences. Uh, you're in demand as a speaker, you travel quite a bit. Uh, one of the areas of your expertise happens to be this whole business about certificates of need or the rules that have to uh, be adhered to if uh, businesses or hospitals or others are going to be able to expand and open facilities. Now, before we dive into it, can you tell uh, my audience a bit about how you got into this kind of work and what, what attracts you to this? Maybe we'll, a little bit about what you do nowadays. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, part of my interest is just the interest in healthcare in general. My uh, father is a physician. My brother was a physician. Um, so I, I've always had a, a little bit of a tangential interest in in the healthcare industry um, anyway. Uh, but this one really came up uh, not so much because of the of healthcare, but just because the nature of the regulation is so obviously anti-competitive. It uh, so obviously exists to protect incumbent providers, um, those who are already offering care, uh, to the expense of their competitors, but also, unfortunately, to the expense of patients and payers. And so because of that, that's really what kind of got me interested in the, in the issue. Uh, you know, my view is um, we should be trying to uh, amend and, and uh, reform and eliminate those regulations that are that are have have the you know that it's it's the mo most obviously anti um, general welfare type of regulation are the ones that should be the first ones to go uh, and so you know there's reasons for those on the right who are you know interested in seeing more markets flourish and seeing more competition um, want to get rid of these regulations, but there's also interest, I think, in those on the left trying to get rid of regulations that benefit, you know, big and wealthy providers uh, at the expense of the little guy. So that's really kind of what attracted me to the regulation at first. Well, there's something in this uh, indeed for, for everyone, uh, regardless of political background. We're, we're looking at a real human need. Uh, people are not getting the medical care that they absolutely need. And we need to do something about it. I, I can't see anything uh, more worthy of, to rally around than something like that. And uh, I like your approach. Uh, but first, uh, brass tacks. Let, let's talk about what a certificate of need is and, and why in the world it is required. Uh, 
if you would just you speak to our, our very wide and general audience, um, give us a little bit of explanation. Absolutely. So it's it's an unusual regulation, and it's unusual in so far as the aim is not to assess the quality of the provider, the adequacy of their facility, you know, um, their safety record, anything like that. The entire aim of the regulation is to second guess the provider's belief that their the service that they want to offer is actually needed. So as you can imagine, this is pretty uh, strange, pretty unusual in a market economy to have a regulation like this. Uh, you know, the vast majority of other goods and services, nobody asks a provider or a would-be um, service provider, you know, do you think that this service is needed? Obviously, they're, by virtue of the fact that they want to offer the service, they, they must think it is needed. Um, so that sort of makes it unusual uh, right off the bat. But then there are other characteristics that make it quite unusual as well. So in their um, attempt to assess whether a provider, you know, the, uh, the service is needed, it's quite costly. And in Hawaii, it's uniquely costly because there's no limit. It goes up to uh, the, the potential fees are a uh, percentage of the cost of the um, investment. And so there's with no cap on it, that's, that's sort of somewhat unique. Um, and it can take take um, months, sometimes even years for the process. But that in itself doesn't make it all that unusual. There's a lot of regulations that are that are like this. But here's the part that's really strange is in your attempt to try to pr prove um, that the service you want to offer is needed, your competitors, those who are already in business, actually have a role to play. So they are uh, allowed to come before the regulator, oppose the application, um, they are allowed to even sit on the, on the con boards often in states um, and play, you know, a role essentially in determining whether or not they get any competition. Now, remarkably, in a lot of states, it's pretty common uh, for the the incumbent providers to then sort of negotiate with with whoever is trying to enter the market, and they may come to an agreement that says, okay, so long as you don't encroach on my territory, you, you don't offer your your needed healthcare service anywhere near me, or then it's okay. Um, you know that's pretty remarkable. In, in uh, um, antitrust, that would be a per se violation of the Sherman Antitrust Act if if it were a uh, you know private people colluding like that or divvying up territory. Um, but because it's um, encouraged by the state, it's not illegal. Um, and and then finally. Uh, the regulation itself, typically will a certificate of need will be denied if it can be shown that it will duplicate an existing service. So what the regulation calls duplication is what economists and frankly, what normal people, I think, everywhere call competition. So it's essentially mandating that there not be any uh, sort of competitive provision of healthcare. It's a pretty, pretty um, bizarre sort of regulation. Well, indeed, it is. And uh, just so that uh, we understand what you're you're talking about, uh, under c certificate of need laws, if a hospital wanted to add services, or if uh, a group of people in a rural community wants to want to have a clinic started. They have to go before a board that contains, um, um, I mean, that has uh, competitors judging whether or not there's a real need of this service. It's kind of, like, kind of like saying uh, a group of people want to start a hamburger stand, but they have to get the approval of McDonald's and Burger King to be able to set one up. And it, that's, that's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah, that's that's absolutely right. And, you know, I often make that analogy and I hear other people make the analogy, um, you know, of uh, McDonald's having to get Wendy's, uh, you know, permission. But it's worse than that because uh, we're talking about life and death here. We're talking about services that patients want and that medical professionals are qualified to give. And Hawaii is is unique in that it it requires a certificate of need for more healthcare services than any other state in the union. 
Uh, we'll get to this in a minute, but there's actually quite a few states that have no certificate of need laws whatsoever, which is why we kind of know how they work. Um, but the um, Hawaii requires it for 28 different uh, services and technologies, uh, including services that are needed by vulnerable populations, uh, substance abuse um, facilities, psychiatric care facilities, um, and then, you know, of course, uh, open heart surgery and or organ transplants and uh, neurosurgery and all sorts of other types of services as well. What are what are some others uh, that people would be surprised to hear Hawaii requires a certificate of need in order to op operate? Uh, well, let's see. So um, ground ambulances, um, burn care. Um, th this is that one. I Whenever I see that one, I, I always scratch my head because, you know, one of the original rationales for a certificate of need is to try to discourage providers from offering um, care that's not needed. You know, so there was this idea that, well, maybe providers are over, uh, are, are, are offering more care than people need. Um, maybe they're sort of like upselling patients, you know, um, for more expensive and elaborate procedures, especially in light of insurance and the fact that patients often aren't, you know, actually paying the bills. So, okay, that, that makes somewhat sense. Um, but I don't think there's any evidence anywhere that has ever been accumulated to suggest that doctors are offering burn care when burn care is not needed. Um, you know, that's just just sort of silly. Uh, same thing goes for neonatal uh, intensive care, uh, which is also regulated, um, of, of uh, nursing home care, um, hospice care, which is generally thought to be a low cost alternative to, you know, um, end of life care in a hospital. Um, this is exactly the kind of alternative care that we've, you know, politicians left, right, and middle have been trying to encourage. Uh, it's it's bizarre that in um, states like Hawaii, we're actually trying to limit this low cost alternative. It's oh, counterproductive. Another one as well. Now uh, there are a lot of states, as you mentioned, that have reformed or uh, abandoned their con laws, and uh, one of the reasons is that there has been some research out there showing what the negative impact is of con laws on various communities. Can, can you sum up some of that? Yeah. So, you know, going back to almost your original question of what made me interested in this topic, and one of the things that got me interested in in it is just the, sh the, the fact, the sheer number of uh, studies that have been done on this. Um, it's really, you don't, you don't encounter this very often. Um, but what has happened, so basically, you know, the federal government encouraged states to adopt con laws uh, dating all the way back to the 70s. They withheld federal funds from any state that didn't adopt a con law. Um, and by the 80s, they were sort of already amassing some data and some evidence to suggest that they didn't work. So the federal mandate went away. And at that point, about 15 states, uh, 12 states did it like right away. And then over the next few years, a few more. Uh, did away with their certificate of need laws. So now we have uh, essentially this this kind of nice natural experiment. Um, you know, Louis Brandeis famously talked about um, the states of laboratories of democracy. What's interesting is that that was a, a certificate of need case. It had to do with selling ice. It's a, one of the other rare areas where <laughs> you need a certificate of need. But um, there was a, um, it, it really is truly a laboratory because now um, about a third of the country happens to live in a state where there's no either no or extremely limited certificate of need laws in healthcare. So these are you know high income, low income, uh, urban, rural, uh, coastal, inter intercontinental, all sorts of different uh, varieties of states. And we can look at what's happened in those states uh, that have either done away or, or significantly pared back their certificate of need laws compared to states like Hawaii that have them. And so as it turns out, it's been an extremely well-studied uh, topic. Uh, so there have been um, uh, over 400 separate tests assessing the effect of CON on, um, out on, on access, cost, and quality. And it's really extraordinary in terms of how overwhelming the evidence is because they almost all point in the same direction. Uh, so, you know, just to take one example, um, all of the tests that look at the effect of con on uh, spending. So 65% of them find that con is associated with 
increased spending per service. Uh, only 7% find that it's associated with diminished spending per service. Um, and the, the rest, which is uh, 28%, find um, negligible results. Uh, availability, so acts, the, the availability of services for patients, 79% of uh, studies that have looked at this question find that CON is associated with diminished availability of services. Only six tests, 8% uh, of the entire sample find that CON um, is associated with greater availability of services. Uh, quality of care, 49% of tests, almost, almost half, find that CON actually undermines the quality of care. Just 10% of tests that have looked at that question find that it increases the quality of care. And in, and in many cases, in those instances, um, it actually, they're not finding that it increases the quality of care. It, it just um, stops the use of expensive procedures that may, for which there may be, um, you know, better alternatives. So uh, among the tests, you know, that are finding that it's associated with lower quality though, um, we're talking higher mortality rates following heart attack, heart failure, and pneumonia, um, higher readmission rates following heart attack and heart failure, uh, lower patient satisfaction levels. Patients are less likely to give their hospitals a nine or a 10 on a 10 point scale, um, greater, um, use of physical restraint in nursing homes in states that have con laws relative to those that don't. Um, there's lower uh, nursing uh, staff ratios in certificate of need states. Um, hospitals are, are more likely to be performed by um, surgeons that are lower quality surgeons based on metrics of their, the outcomes that they, that they um, are able to obtain in con states relative to non-con states. So very serious consequences for patients and um, of course, serious consequences for taxpayers who are paying more for services and for anybody who just wants convenient care. It's, it's pretty extraordinary. Well, it's quite remarkable that when you take a look at the quality of care, the cost of care, access to care, uh, we definitely received low marks in Hawaii. And what you're telling us is that that may very well be partly due to con laws. Now, why then? Do we keep them? Yeah. So um, that's a great question. So it really goes back to uh, what economists, it's, a, it's a, probably a, a favorite phrase among economists when they're uh, teaching political economy, which is this idea of concentrated benefits and diffuse costs. And the basic idea here is that you may have a policy where the costs outweigh the benefits, but if those who bear the costs are so numerous, so diffuse, and typically um, don't know that they're bearing the costs, then those who benefit from it are able to get organized and maintain the, the uh, policy. So I've, you know, go around the uh, country and have testified in about, uh, I don't know, maybe a dozen, two dozen states on certificate of need laws. And uh, every time I show up, there is, uh, you know, me, there might be somebody from, uh, you know, an antitrust, uh, official from the Federal Department of Justice or the FTC, because they now have come to the uh, opinion that con laws are anti-competitive. And so they're happy to tell um, legislators that they that these are anti-competitive laws. Um, but then on the other side, it's usually, you know, 20 deep of uh, hospital association uh, lobbyists who are there to defend the, the laws, you know, uh, very, very strenuously. Um, and they have come up with a number of different arguments over the years. I mentioned, you know, the, the initial rationale for con law was that it was going to discourage unneeded or um, unnecessary procedures. Um, but over the years, they've come up with other rationales. They say that it's needed to increase uh, access to care for vulnerable populations, which is uh, there's no zero evidence that it does that. In fact, we have some evidence that it uh, decreases care uh, to vulnerable populations. It's associated with um, higher um, racial disparities in the provision of certain pr procedures. Um, it's associated with less care in rural uh, populations. Um, and it's associated with, with lower profit, profitability for um, safety net hospitals, hospitals that cater to uh, lower income populations. Um, so, you know, the arguments sort of shift over time, but um, no matter where they shift, the data still suggests that con laws don't work. Hawaii health officials 
often point out that the con laws are, are not what are are not a real problem because con applications are, are very rarely denied. Would you agree that this is an indication that our state con laws work? So it may be. Um, I, I wouldn't say it's an indication that they work, but it may be an indication that they aren't uh, especially severe, uh, which is we, we have great metrics of which states, you know, have, regulate which procedures. Uh, and I mentioned Hawaii, you know, tops the list in terms of the number of services and procedures that it regulates. We have pretty good metrics, uh, but it's kind of spotty in terms of uh, looking at things like the uh, the cost of the procedures or, or the cost of the application. One thing that it, you kind of have to have to figure out on a case by case basis is uh, how often uh, applications are accepted or denied, and so you kind of go through FOIA requests and and you and you figure that out. Now, if you have a state that has a pretty high acceptance rate that still may not be an indication that this is a low barrier to entry. Um, you'd want to look at a couple of other things. So, you know, one of the things you'd want to look at is that the um, the number of people that are choosing not to apply because they don't want to go through the hassle. Um, if you only have large, you know, uh, players, which is typically the ones that, you know, benefit from con laws, um, if you ha only have them uh, applying, then you know, and they're they're typically able to get through, then it's exactly doing what they want it to do. Uh, but it still is harming patients and harming other providers. Uh, so that'd be one one question. Uh, another question would be to look at how long does it take to obtain a certificate of need um, and how much time and money do people have to spend in order to do that? So one of the things I often recommend to people, there are some states that are just like ready to get rid of certificate of need laws tomorrow. Uh, South Carolina, you may know, just uh, passed pretty significant legislation doing away with just about all of their con laws, except for uh, nursing homes. Um, and they were like like Hawaii; they were a, a pretty uh, high regulator. Uh, but other states are not ready to take that that step. And so, one of the things I often recommend is there are a number of things you can do on the way to full repeal. And one of them is you could actually um, use uh, the legislative process to mandate that the con regulator gather data that's helpful for you. So require the con regulator to, on a regular basis, publish what percentage of con applications are granted and what percentage are denied. Uh, report uh, how many of those that are denied and, and accepted, how many of those were, are opposed by incumbent providers so that we have a sense of how much our incumbents able to block their competition. Um, it would be great even if if uh, the the regulator gathered data from providers um, to help illustrate, you know, help us better understand what kind of a barrier is this. So anytime anybody applies for a con, the the application could ask, uh, how many man hours did this did this con application take you? Um, by your best guess, how many patients, how much care are you not providing? Um, because you had to go through this process. Uh, so kind of gathering some information like that, I think could help better um, help us better understand um, you know the the veracity of that claim that you're that you encounter. Or a state like Hawaii, which has such extensive con laws, what's the most practical way to get started reforming the system? Uh, what are some lessons we could learn from others? Yeah. so I, I think what I the the um, the the types of reforms I just mentioned I think would be good easy steps. There's there's nobody really can have a objection to um, transparency, right? Um, I think a next uh, simple step is always to to raise the thresholds at which uh, con uh, tr is triggered. So if it's a very low uh, threshold that you know you you just want to spend a thousand dollars to add a hospital bed or whatever, uh, and you have to go through a con, that's pretty ridiculous. Um, so that's kind of simple. Uh, some other steps, though, that would start moving you closer, I think, to the end goal are, are worth considering. Um, so we've already mentioned some of the rarely reg uh, regulated procedures that I think are, um, you, it's really hard to come up with a rationale for them. So if it's standing in the way of care for vulnerable patients, I mean, substance abuse cons, uh, I don't think they have any business in the year 2023. Um, same goes for uh, psychiatric care cons, burn care, neonatal intensive care, 
hospice care, home health care, anything that is providing care for people that that's a lower cost alternative or that's to uh, vulnerable populations, I think that should uh, easily be looked at. And that's what a lot of states have done is they just get away, do away with those types of cons. Um, you, if you want to go more significantly, five states have certificate of need laws, but they don't involve incumbent providers. Incumbent providers aren't allowed to uh, oppose the application of would-be competitors. Uh, they're not allowed to sit on the con board. That to me makes um, you know eminent sense. Um, another uh, uh, step in that same direction is to get rid of the word duplication in the regulations so that a con isn't denied just based on the fact that a, a competitor might duplicate, i.e. compete with an existing service. Could you share some insights uh, on the potential economic consequences of reforming or abolishing con laws in Hawaii? Yeah. In what way, for example, might it impact uh, job creation or economic growth in, in the health sector? So this is actually sort of cutting edge um, research. I, I know of a few um, researchers that are looking at the jobs question, and I think we'll have results in the next um, hopefully weeks to months. Uh, but I can't I can't answer the jobs except to say that we know that there are more service providers. So that almost certainly means more jobs. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what kinds of jobs. But uh, you know, the average patient in a con state um, has access to thirty percent fewer hospitals. Um, they have access to 14% fewer ambulatory surgery centers. They have access to about 30% fewer rural hospitals and 13% fewer rural ambulatory surgery centers. So all of those are going to be, um, once those cons are eliminated, that's that's more jobs in uh, both urban and rural settings, I think. Um, I, I'm guessing that's what, the, what these uh, researchers are going to find. Um, the other way we can look at the economics of it is to look at the profitability of providers. And so... Um, you know, back to one of your questions was why? Why do we have these providers are scared that they're going to go out of business if they are open to competition? The evidence actually is that profits go up over the long run. They take a short term dive as 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 new competition comes in, but over the longer run, profitability actually uh, returns and exceeds what it was uh, before it was repealed. In states that have successfully repealed or, um, in in some way modified their con laws. What do you think are some of the, the more important strategic factors in being able to bring that about? So I do think it's it's uh, very helpful to have a pretty broad coalition. Um, so in South Carolina, for example, you know there were physicians who were pushing for the elimination of of their certificate of need laws. Uh, the American Medical Association is opposed to con laws. There were um, antitrust officials at the Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission that were willing to come and talk uh, about these. There were economists. There were also uh, uh, people who had a financial stake to, who could gain from the elimination of con laws. Um, they were uh, device makers, you know, the, like people who make uh, CT scanners and MRI machines and things like that. They, uh, I think, were involved in that, um, as were insurance companies. They con laws make um, the cost of care more expensive, and as payers, they don't like that. Um, so they were opposed to it. Uh, I think that helps a lot. I, but ultimately, I think being able to tell the human story and talk about how you know there's actual patients, actual constituents in your community who, you know, frankly, their lives are put in danger by not having access to higher quality. Um, lower cost care. You know, why would, do we want to protect incumbent providers at such an incredible cost? It, do, it doesn't make a lot of sense. And I think helping helping to tell those stories really does make a difference. Very good. Well, Matthew, thank you so much for being with us uh, today. You've certainly got a great deal of expertise on certificate of needs. And perhaps we could have you out here in Hawaii helping us to uh, reform our laws. Uh, they, 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 that's a certainly a great need, but uh, glad you were able to be with us today. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. It's always great to chat with you. Well, my guest today has been Matthew Mitchell, a senior research fellow at the Nee Center for the Study of Occupational Regulation, all the way away at West Virginia University. Until next time, we wish you an aloha. I'm Kili'i Aquino with the Grassroot Institute. You're watching Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Together. Hello.